So one of the environments that we have DBoss running on is the MIT Super Cloud, which is in Holyoke, Massachusetts. It has 32,000 processors. It has several terabytes, that's for the T of, of main memory, and many terabytes of secondary storage. So the resources that the operating system has to manage has gone up by about six orders of magnitude in the last 40-ish years. So without me saying another word, that makes managing operating system state, which is keeping track of tasks, resources, processes, files, all that stuff, that makes keeping track of operating system state, that makes it a database problem, without me saying another word. Hi, Mike. Thank you for joining me on the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Richie. Wonderful. So you're most famous for your work on the PostgreSQL database. So can you tell me what you think led to its phenomenal success? So, so first of all, its phenomenal success had almost nothing to do with me. So, so it, was, it was picked up in 1995 by a pickup team of programmers who have promoted it, shepherded it ever since. And so they, they deserve most of the credit. Uh, and you say, why, why is it taking over the world? Uh, well, it's a much better database system than MySQL. And hopefully, you know, cream rises to the top. Uh, but also, uh, people were kind of afraid when Oracle bought, bought MySQL and that Postgres has remained purely community driven all this time. And I think, I think you know, it, it, it's a perfect example of what open source is supposed to be. I'm delighted that the, the big the, the elephants, the uh, cloud elephants, are pretty much standardizing on, on the Postgres wire protocol. And so I think I think it, it's going to be it, it will become a very very dominant database system. Well, the interface there will be lots of implementations. Yeah, I love that. that um, it is really it's a community that's grown and created something amazing, and it's still continuing to evolve sort of decades after its introduction. So, um, is there anything that you're most excited about in the world of SQL databases? Andy Pavlo and I wrote, wrote, a, wrote a paper. Well, I wrote a paper in, in 2007 saying, you know, what goes around comes around and there aren't any new data models. Uh, Andy Pavlo and I wrote a paper that's going to appear in Sigma Record that's, uh, you know, 15 years later and here, here's a summary of what the paper says, that there aren't, there aren't any new data models that are gonna get traction in our opinion. And all, all the interesting ideas are in either hardware stuff or in new applications. Uh, and I think, for example, the, everyone is moving everything they can to the cloud as quickly as they can. And that's for all kinds of good reasons. And so it seems to me the most exciting thing that I see is that uh, if you're doing one of these cloud migrations, you have a once in a generation opportunity to try and fix the sins of your predecessor. Uh, and so you can either do a lift and shift at which point your successor will inherit the sins of your predecessor, uh, or you can refactor, rewrite, intelligently move to the cloud. And I think that's, that's the most exciting macro trend. Uh, other things are, uh, when you move to the cloud, the cloud basically forces you to have disaggregated storage. And that's forcing all the database vendors to completely rewrite their stuff. Uh, and the reason for that is that networking has gotten a will a lot faster uh, than it used to be, and that enables you to do disaggregated storage. 
Uh, the second thing is the, the big cloud vendors make it financially very attractive to have software as a service, function as a service, serverless computing. And that will encourage all application writers to rewrite their stuff. Also will encourage uh, database systems to adopt that model. So there's lots of changes driven by the cloud guys. In terms of new applications, I think uh, how, how is machine learning uh, large language models going to be supported by database systems? I mean, what, what, where's that gonna go? I think it's an exciting thing to watch. Uh, I think genomic databases are gonna become much more prevalent and how are those going to be supported? So I think, uh, and then I think uh, the topic that we're supposed to talk about is, uh, you know, can, can the operating system really become a database system? And that's basically a new application area for databases. So I think new application areas are, are fascinating. And I think the cloud slash hardware changes are, are really fascinating. I'm not expecting anything to happen in, in data models that, uh, that uh, I think the relational model is the answer and I don't see that changing. Okay, um, lots to unpack there. I like your first point about how um, you always inherit uh, the sensing predecessor. Like I think uh, this is familiar to anyone who's worked with data that there's some sort of horrendous uh, <laughs> blob of data there that you're like, well, yeah, I'm not sure I want to touch that. So um, the idea that you've got to maintain things and uh, improve them as, as you go along, uh, avoiding the technical debt, that seems very important. Um, and then on your last point about uh, databases and the operating system, it does seem like databases are pretty much everywhere and the operating system is one of the sort of last holdouts. Um, so since your new project is around creating an operating system with a database at its core, can you tell me why do operating systems need databases? So uh, I, I have lots of gray hair. So I was a very early user of Unix in 1974 on a PDP 1140. Uh, one processor, uh, 48K of main memory, not, not M or G, K, uh, and 20 megabytes of secondary storage. So one of the environments that we have DBoss running on is the MIT SuperCloud, uh, which is in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Uh, it has 32,000 processors. Uh, it has several terabytes, that's for the T, of, of main memory, and many terabytes of secondary storage. So the resources that the operating system has to manage has gone up by about six orders of magnitude uh, in the last 40-ish years. So without me saying another word, that makes uh, managing operating system state, which is keeping track of of tasks, resources, processes, files, all that stuff. That makes keeping tr operating track of operating system state, that makes it a database problem without me saying another word. And so you want to apply database technology to what's an obvi obviously a database problem. And so that's number one. Uh, number two, Linux is now 40-ish years old. Unix is 50-ish years old. Uh, and that makes them legacy software uh, that's been maintained, patched, extended over a long period of time. Uh, and the Linux community is having a very hard time making forward progress. So for example, there is no multi-node multi version of Linux. And so everybody who is running a multi-node system, which includes most everybody, uh, has to run has to run an orc a multi-node orchestrator, something like Kubernetes. Uh, also, Linux is well known to be a leaky security boat, so people layer all kinds of security stuff on top of it. Uh, and so what you have is a patchwork of of operating system software uh, that is a man management nightmare uh, and is still a leaky security boat. Uh, and so 
the fact that Linux is legacy uh, means that it's time to send it to the home for tired software. So scale and and legacy are the reasons to uh, you know start with a clean state slate and start anew. Okay, that multi-node idea in particular sounds interesting. So I know, like early, you mentioned that this is a solved problem with databases. Is that now because databases are in the cloud, they have to work on multiple servers at once, and so. Um, I can see. I think I can see where this is going in terms of having the operating system have that capability as well. But um, I am enough to remember that um, this has been tried before. So maybe twenty years or so ago, Microsoft tried to put um, a database at the heart of the operating system with WinFS, and then they abandoned that project. So what's different this time? So the project, which was called Longhorn internally, uh, uh, I you know, sort of sleuthed around a bunch uh, as to what happened when we started building DBoss. And the general consensus inside Microsoft was that uh, Longhorn was a good idea. Uh, nobody disputed the ideas. Uh, and everybody internally said that its problems were bad management and feature creep. That, that uh, you know, it got more and more and more ambitious before it ever worked. Uh, and so I think, uh, I think technically it's a very good idea and was then. Uh, and it suffered from, from internal politics, internal management issues, and especially feature creep. Because uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I've had, I've, been involved with or watched a whole bunch of startups. And the worst thing in the world that any startup can do is engage in feature creep. Uh, you want to get something running. And once you get it running, then you can worry about extending it. Uh, and so Microsoft didn't pay attention to that lesson. It's, it's definitely a, a big problem being tempted to add lots of features because when you, you're just building something from scratch and there's like so many exciting things you want to add to it. But I can see how that can become dangerous if you've not shipped anything. Um, so one of the things you said you were excited about in the world of databases is, is that there are lots of um, application-specific databases for different use cases. And it feels like the same thing is also true of operating systems. There are different operating systems for different use cases. So what is your intended use case for DBoss? So I think as, as any startup, uh, the, you know, we, we are, well, DBoss started as a academic research project in 2020 jointly with MIT and Stanford. And so we had a running system uh, that we decided to commercialize. And like any startup, the mantra is uh, get a product out as quickly as you can. And then in the vernacular, see if the dogs are going to eat the dog food. And if they're not, uh, they will tell you instantly why, why they don't like it. So, so our, our goal is to get a product out as quickly as possible. And we did that. So in a year, we sh we've shipped a commercial version of DBoss. Uh, and we had the advantage of having uh, a person named Michael Coden be part of the research project and also part of the commercial venture. And until recently, he was the uh, managing partner of the cybersecurity practice for Boston Consulting Group. And so through him, we got to talk to lots, lots of enterprise folks, uh, big and small in a whole bunch of different areas. And so here, here's who saluted to those conversations. Uh, first of all, the three letter agencies, uh, you know, the, the defense, defense, defense industry who is really focused on security. Uh, the second place where people really saluted were in financial services dealing with moving money around. Uh, and so one thing I learned 
uh, from interviewing a large regional bank uh, here in the Northeast was they, they listened, they talked with us and they said, wow, you solved the once and only once problem. And that was the first I'd ever heard of that, that. but here's what he actually meant, which is <clears throat> if I'm going to move $10 from my account to Rich, your account, uh, then we're pro- almost certainly in different systems. Uh, and so the way the transaction should work is you debit my account, send a message to your account, increment your account, send a return message, and then commit the transaction. So this is basically a distributed commit problem. And in the banking world, most of the systems that this regional bank used don't have XA support or any distributed commit support. So the bank was forced to do this themselves. And so they figure that somewhere between a third and half of their application logic is dealing with once and only once. And it's brittle, problem prone, hard to get right. Distributed commit is not for the faint of heart. And so they would love to get rid of all that code. And we do it automatically because we run the network system is the database is in the database. The database is in the database. And so we we control all pieces of that of that interaction. And so we solve the once and only once problem, you know, automatically. And he was very excited about that. So Fin Services uh, worries about about distributed commit, also worries about security. Uh, the third place people got very interested was what I'll call scuff shoe enterprises, you know, which are enterprises that bend metal and build, you know, do real things. And so one particular enterprise that oh, I won't name uh, described their current security system. Uh, they have 100,000 endpoints. They're very big conglomerate. Uh, And so uh, they have one particular security vendor who who does event extraction off of 100,000 endpoints. That's a seven digit a year subscription in US dollars. Uh, And they then uh, send those events through a proprietary, you know, through a, you know, their enterprises, a, a you know, a custom workflow system that enriches the events with with uh, enterprise specific data. They then pass pass these enriched events to another security product, another seven digit a year subscription, and uh, they and the vendor have written several hundred monitoring rules, uh, and so. Uh, in production, you know, if a monitoring rule fires, uh, they have a human analyst look at it to make sure it's not a false positive. And if it's not a false positive, then they take action. The time, elapsed time between when, uh, a, you know, a bad guy knocks at the door and, they, and them taking action is measured in, in multiple hours. And they are just terrified of ransomware attacks. And so they, they have known many of their peers to have succumbed to ransomware attacks. It tends to take all production down for multiple days at a time and costs a billion dollars if you're a, you know, a big enterprise. So they are terrified about security. And the thing they love about DBoss is DBoss recovers automatically from ransomware attacks. Uh, And the reason we can do that is we have everything in the database, everything. All the operating systems, the state is in the database. And we keep a log of that state historically. We spool it into a data warehouse. And so if you want to back up the operating system 18 minutes, you just do it. 
Uh, and if applications put all, if this is fast enough for the operating system, it's certainly fast enough for your application. So if your application puts all state in the database, then when we back up 18 minutes, we back up everything 18 minutes. And so if you had a ransomware attack 17 minutes ago, you just backed up 18 minutes, single step around the bad guy and let the system go. So they're very excited about our, you know, our security story. Their problem is that they are dragging a huge legacy code base around. And so to take advantage of DBoss, you would have to restructure, refactor, rewrite a bunch of it. And that's, that's a project for the decades. And so that will be a, a very, very slow market on the uptake. So with that said, what, what we're aiming uh, for the initial commercial DBoss users are the three letter agencies, uh, financial services, especially startups, uh, and uh, adventuresome enterprises who are willing to refactor stuff uh, on the way to the cloud. So that's, that, that was a long answer to your short question. Yeah, so I have to say, I was thinking you swap out your operating system is probably going to result in a fairly small productivity boost. But the things you're talking about there, these are pretty dramatic. Like the idea that just solving um, this distributed transaction problem, that's going to enable like banks to cut out half of their code base. That's going to be a huge like productivity boost from the maintenance. And then the manufacturing example of just saying, okay, we've got better security. This is going to protect us from ransomware. This is like pretty amazing stuff. The thing, the thing I found really, really exciting is that most everyone we talk to about the idea thinks it's conceptually fantastic. Uh, and so the, you know, getting, getting to an implementation is a small matter of, small matter of legacy code. Uh, so anyway, I'm really excited about, about the possibilities. This does sound very cool. Um, so it sounds like um, the big use case of this is going to be around um, infrastructure for cloud applications. So via software as a service stuff. And so can you just talk me through, in general, what does the infrastructure for cloud applications currently look like? Well, well, to start with, if you move to the cloud, then you are, as I said earlier, you're highly encouraged to, to take a software as a service model and you get disaggregated storage, stuff like S3. Uh, and so, uh, our point of view is that if, if the world is moving from on-prem to the cloud, we should go to where the market's going to be, not where it was. And so right now, DBoss is a cloud-only service. Uh, it runs software as a service uh, so that you only uh, are using resources when you are actually running, and if you're idle, you're not using any. And we, we, you know, and the other thing to note is that transactional databases have gotten wildly faster in the last decade or two. So it's fast enough to put a database system at the bottom. Uh, and so that's what we do. So we run on the bare metal. Well, we run, we run on a microkernel. Uh, and at some point, we may well write our own microkernel so that we're really running on the bare metal. Uh, and so Linux is nowhere in sight. Uh, right now, we are running on AWS. We're running on one of their microkernels called Firecracker. Uh, and we, the database system is the only thing running on top of Firecracker. And uh, on top of the database system, we write, uh, you know, we've written a file system, a messaging system, a bunch of schedulers, and your application runs on top of that stuff. So just so you, everybody gets really clear what we have in mind, let me tell you how the messaging system works. It is not TCP IP at all. 
Uh, it is not a heavyweight thing. And it's all written in SQL. And what do I mean by that? Well, to send, there's a message table with a sender, a receiver, and a payload. And send a message, you do an insert into that table. That's one line of SQL. Uh, we're running on top of a partitioned, multi-node, highly available DBMS. So that tuple ends up at the site, the home site of the receiver. And so to uh, read a message, you just do a SQL query, uh, another one line of SQL. So that's the message system. Uh, once you go outside of our environment, we have a gateway that goes out onto TCP, IP, and the rest of the world. But inside us, it's all just the database. So everything is just the database. And so the database system is the only thing running besides a small microkernel. Uh, and as software as a service, the way software as a service works is you have to structure your application as a graph of workflow steps. Uh, you can call them micro ops operations. They're just pieces of code. So right now uh, we've decided to support, uh, we, we used to run on JavaScript and we now, and Java, and now we've moved to TypeScript because it seems to be more popular. So you write a collection of operations in TypeScript and you tell us the graph of those operations. And so that's the way you have to structure your application to get a uh, software service to work. We accept uh, that graph and those operations. We store them in the database and we have a tiny orchestrator that, that wakes up uh, any given operation when its inputs are available and it produces an output, all of that's in the database. So you just have to write a graph of TypeScript and we take care of everything else. So we, we run it for you. Uh, if it seems to be running slowly, we give you more resources and so forth. Okay, um, so I have to say, I love the idea that um, the messaging system is just a, a table in a database, so you can write SQL queries against it. I'd love to get into that uh, a little bit more later, but just for now, what are the implications for anyone who wants to develop applications on top of DBoss? All you have to do, well, you have to run on, we run on the cloud. Uh, at some point, we will probably support an on-prem deployment, but on-prem comes with just a ton of idiosyncratic behavior, you know, on the part of whatever uh, your shop is doing. But we run, we run on AWS, we will run in the near future on Azure and on GCP. And so all you have to do is produce, you know, this graph of TypeScript, uh, you have to be using TypeScript. And I, I expect in very short order, we will support 10 languages because uh, TypeScript is certainly not, it's popular, but it's certainly not universal. So if, uh, if we will probably support uh, Java, we'll probably support JavaScript, we'll probably support Python. Uh, we'll support Go if, if there's enough, I mean, we'll support, languages as there's interest in us supporting them. Uh, and uh, in short order, we will run on the popular clouds in a variety of programming languages. Uh, and what you get is that every one of your operations is a transaction. And so you, you know, one of the big problems people have with software as a service applications is that they're broken up into a whole bunch of steps that are running in parallel. Uh, and so if there's race conditions between the parallel operations, those are fiendishly hard to debug. But in our system, they're transactions uh, and we sort it out with the concurrency control system. 
So there are basically few to none race conditions. Uh, and so if you know the word Heisenbug, uh, it was a term coined by Jim Gray, uh, the late Jim Gray, we avoid almost all Heisenbugs. Uh, we also give you a debugger because if we can back up the operating system, we can also back up your application. So if you're in debug mode, you simply, and something bad happens, we sim you can simply back up three minutes, uh, single step forward, uh, change the code, change the data. So we give you a really nifty debugging environment, but we give you transactions for everything. Uh, and so if you want to ask questions about your application, the state of your application is in the same uh, data warehouse as the operating system stuff. So you can just uh, use SQL to ask questions about what's happening. Uh, you can use SQL to ask, uh, you know, for example, uh, if you think that I'm possibly a bad actor, you want to know who I've sent messages to, who they've sent messages to, transitive closure of who I've ever talked to. And that's just SQL. Uh, so right now, you know, asking questions about what's going on is really, really difficult. And it's very easy to do monitoring. So uh, we talked, to, we, right now you have to sort of move what amounts to the event log into some proprietary system uh, that talks you know, a proprietary language. In our world, it all goes into a data warehouse. You can just query it in SQL. So you get much easier monitoring. You get uh, a fancy debugger. You get super security. Uh, you get, you know, multi-node support. You don't have to run Kubernetes. Uh, and you're not running Linux. And so you get a much simpler environment to maintain a lot less moving parts, a lot more security, uh, and you get you know a, a next generation programming environment. So it's very attractive to application developers. Most we've talked to a whole bunch of them, and most of them, most of them think, "Wow, this is really neat." Uh, and then they say, "Yeah, but you, you don't support Go or or you know pick pick." Pick, pick an objection. And so uh, the, real, the real question is, uh, you know, we could support all of POSIX, which is sort of yesterday's standard. Uh, I'm really reluctant to do that because most people on the cloud don't, give, don't care about POSIX at all. They're focused on, you know, workflow standards, and stuff like that. So we'd like to be uh, supportive of, net, of the standards coming rather than yesterday's news. So, but the, the question is how, how big an application surface do we have to support in order to get traction? And we'll find out, or we are finding out uh, as we speak. Okay, uh, I think your point about Heisenberg is really interesting because certainly, as a user of web applications, I've often had the experience where something's gone wrong, you report the bug, and then the response back as well, I can't reproduce this, is maybe a temporary glitch. And then from the engineer side, they're like, well, you know, <laughs> how do I fix this if, uh, if I can't reproduce this? So the idea that um, those categories of temporary problems are going to largely go away because you've got that state, that just seemed like a huge step forward. Well, well. Data, database systems have this problem in spades. I mean, I was, I worked for a bunch of different database companies. Uh, and so if, if you have a Heisen bug, you know, the, then the user sends you the bug and you can't reproduce it. And so if the customer is important enough, you put engineers on airplanes. Uh, and go to the customer site and put a print statement everywhere in sight. Uh, and so they're fiendishly difficult and fiendishly expensive. 
And if the customer is, in, customer is important enough, you're likely to land on the front page of the New York Times. So th this is serious business. Uh, and so we, we, make, we make things a lot better. Going back to um, what you said about how, because everything's sort of SQL internally, you can start doing queries on it. Um, what sort of queries might I want to run against an operating system? Who, who, who in my environment is using more than 100 gigabytes of space, counting only those files bigger than, you know, one gigabyte? Uh, and you can't ask that now, and it's just SQL in our system. Uh, or, you know, uh, which, which three users are chewing up the most resources? Uh, and, you know, is there, is there anybody, you know, who has copied more than 20 files in the last uh, 12 hours? Uh, you know, just et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. From the application developer point of view, um, can you also do debugging by writing SQL queries? Uh, well, we, you know, yeah, of course, but but we also give you this this time travel debugger. But sure, you can you can write write SQL against against the you know, what amounts to the event log, the data you know in the data warehouse, and so yeah, that, that works great. Okay, um, so it it sounds like uh, if you've got a few SQL skills, then it's going to be make uh, a lot of what's happening within the operating system much more accessible. Um, I'd also like to talk a bit about cybersecurity. So you mentioned this before that security is one of the main features, and that you can prevent these ransomware attacks. Um, are there any other uh, security benefits from running DBoss as opposed to another operating system? Well, there's a much there's a much smaller attack surface, uh, so you know, compared to traditional world. So, so there's a lot less gates to close, uh, and you know, you, you know, the current world is you start with Linux, a leaky boat, and you paper over that with a bunch of stuff, and in our opinion, that gets you another leaky boat. And so the, the, way, the way to make security better is to have a much simpler system with a lot less attack surface. And that's exactly what we do. Uh, and so there's much less attack service. You can do much, much better monitoring and you can get up from ransomware attacks you know, easily. So that's, that's our main security story. Okay, just having a, a simpler system means less things can go wrong. Uh, that seems useful to know. I'd also like to ask you a bit about like what it's like to create a startup because often creating a startup is very much seen as a, a, a young person's game and, well, <laughs> you've been around for a while now. So just tell me like what inspired you to create another startup. So my, my career has been in academia and... Most people in academia uh, want to get famous and write papers. Uh, and whether or not they do anything meaningful to the real world is, is irrelevant. Uh, and I, somehow early on, I decided that it, it's important to try and make change. And I learned a long while ago that the very big companies, you know, don't, don't invest in new stuff. Uh, they by and large buy, buy startups after they're somewhat successful. So the way to make, make change happen is to do startups. And so whenever I've had an idea that looked like it was commercializable, to make a difference, you do a startup. And after a while, they get easier and easier for someone like me to do. And nobody has yet complained about my age, uh, which everybody should complain about since I'm old. 
but uh, I'm, I'm going to keep doing this as long as I can make a difference. That's wonderful. It's, it's very inspiring that, you know, just keep, keep plugging away at this and uh, keep coming up with ideas and, and creating stuff. Um, all right. Um, can you tell me a bit about what you're working on with uh, DBoss right now? What's coming soon? Okay. So in the commercial, we've talked about sort of what the commercial guys are thinking about, which is getting the, getting the, getting the first Lighthouse customers, making them happy. Uh, and, you know, doing whatever they need to be successful. Uh, so that's exactly what you would expect. Uh, the academic, academic research on DBOS goes on, so that hasn't stopped. And so the thing that I'm most interested in is that if you look at data, database transactions, uh, the high pole in the tent as to what consumes, what consumes CPU time, it looks like it's pretty much moved to being the networking system. And so to go, fa to go faster, you've got to redo the networking system. Uh, and so, we're looking at all kinds of ways to go fast, to, to send messages faster than inserting them into a database table and then reading them back out again. So we're, we're working on on high poles in the current uh, in the current transactional database stack. Uh, so that that's uh, that's something that I'm very very interested in, and then. Another thing is everybody on the planet is dabbling in large language models, as am I. Uh, and the question of the day is, uh, what, what can large language models do for you know, structured data in database systems? So I'm plugging away at that. So that, that's what I'm focused on, on you know, in an academic context. Okay, um, faster networking and uh, large language models, uh, it's exciting stuff. Um, all right, so do you have any final advice for people who are interested in using DBoss? Sure, <laughs> you know, get at it. <laughs> uh, it, it, works, it works and works well, uh, and it has a ton of advantages, so uh, go go to our website and kick the tires, uh, and you can download. You can sign sign up. To, you know f to freely use the you know the cloud version, software as a service version. So we're we're excited to try and get feedback, uh, and it costs nothing except small amounts of your time. So have at it and, and tell us what you think. All right, super. Uh, everyone gets out of here. You've got, to, uh, you've got a call to action there, audience. Uh, all right, uh, thank you very much for your time, Mike. That was great. Okay, thank you, Richie.